After completing the geography card, we move on to the environment assessment. Some aspects of this are similar to Heritage Place, but there are a couple of differences, which I'll talk about as we get to them. So the first thing to do is to select the topography of your site. So in my case, my site is located on the ocean near the seafloor and on a beach. So I'll select beach and add. Again, if you need to, you can add multiple terms. Simply click again, choose another one, and then click add. You can also choose the type of land cover. This is optional, so it's up to you. In this case, my site would probably be considered bare as there's no vegetation. So I could add that and a date if necessary. After land cover, the next section is geology. And you'll notice that there are no fields displayed here. In order to access the fields, we first click the add button and this will add the term geology beneath. To get to the fields, we simply click on it. And then you will see there are two sections, sufficient geology and bedrock geology. And these are also duplicated in the card tree to the left. So official geology refers to the sediment around your site in the present day. This is the kind of sediment which is either on the ground surface or the seabed surface at the site if you were to walk over it today. So in order to enter information, we simply select an option from the drop down menu. So in my case, I'm dealing with a coastal site, a beach in Yemen. Um, so the sediment type is probably sand. So I would select sand. Some of the sand has probably been deposited by wind action, so by aeolian processes. So I can then choose aeolian for depositional process. I then click add. However, I may also have sand or, which has been deposited by the sea. So I would also include sand deposited by marine and coastal processes and then click add. And you'll see the two terms are here. To edit them, you can click on them. To remove them, you can also click on the little minus. Um, moving on from this, we come to bedrock geology. And this refers to the type of rock which uh, forms the type of rock which characterizes the landscape in which your site is located. So it's the general main rock type that you would see in the landscape today. So in this case, for example, if uh, my study area was located where most of the rocks were basalt, I would select basalt and then add. Again, if you wanted to add multiple terms, you can do that as well. Simply select from the drop down and click add. So once you have these terms entered in the geology section, you can click to return to your environment assessment and then scroll down and you'll see that the geology term is here. And to access it, you can click here or you can click on either one of these subcategories on the card tree. After completing the geology section, we come to the marine environment section. Um, this section is only relevant if your site is located um, on the coast or underwater. For land sites, you do not need to fill this in, but for coastal and underwater sites, it can be quite important. So the first thing to consider is fetch type. So fetch refers to the distance of open water over which wind and waves can travel. So it gives um, an indication of how exposed the site is to wave action. Simply choose the drop down menu and choose one of the categories below. So if waves can travel a distance of 10 to 100 kilometers in order to reach my site, then it is moderately exposed. Conversely, if there is only a distance of 10 kilometers of sea over which waves can travel, my site would be considered protected. In this case, my site is moderately exposed. We then choose the wave climate. These are standard categories um, from coastal science. So we simply choose one of these based on the general environment in which our site is located. So in uh, my area, tropical cyclone would be the um, most likely category. And then I can select the tidal range um, for my particular site, whether a site is a microtidal, it has less than two meters of tidal range, all the way up to macrotidal, more than four meters. My site would be considered mesotidal, between two to four meters tidal range. So I choose that there, and then click add to enter all these terms. Having completed the marine environment section, we move on to the depth and elevation section. 
So this gives information about the depth or elevation at which your site is located. For sites underwater, we tend to use depth. For sites located above water, we tend to use elevation, hence the use of the two terms. So the first term you enter is the maximum elevation of your site. This is the highest point of your site. For underwater sites, it's the shallowest point of your site, hence minimum depth. So let's say, for example, for the site I'm looking at, a series of beach ridges in Yemen, um, the highest one of my ridges is 20 meters above sea level. So I enter 20 in there. The, the next box, you do the same, but for the lowest point of your site. So either the minimum depth elevation for a site on land or the maximum depth for a site underwater. In this case, my site runs down to the beach, so pretty much mean sea level, so I can enter zero. I can then select the datum to which my measurements are referenced to. In my case, I'm looking at mean sea level. If you have more information about the particular datum you're referencing it to, for example, local ordnance datum or local survey datum, which may or may not have an EPSG code, you can enter it in this box as well. And once you have that information, simply click add.